you just put these on the table so they'll record you, but you don't have to speak it to them or anything. We'll pick up. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's event, Community Learning for Environmental Justice Part 6, Navigating Permitting Processes. My name is Lassie Calhoun, and I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs here at ELI. We are offering one hour of general CLE credit in Pennsylvania and Vermont for today's session, continuing legal education and professional education for attorneys that's often required after their admission into a state bar. The information on facts to you about CLE only applies to active attorneys who are attending the event. So if you're not an attorney, you don't need to worry about this part. Well, this event is designed as an opportunity for attorneys to participate in continuing legal education. ELI makes no guarantee that the course will be accredited for CME in any particular state. ELI is an accredited CME provider in Vermont and Pennsylvania, so the course is automatically approved for the CME credit in those two states. ELI will not be applying for a CME accreditation in any other state for this program. Many states offer CME reciprocity with the states in which we are pre approved, so please check to see if your state offers CME reciprocity with Vermont or Pennsylvania. If your state offers CLE less capacity, you may be able to automatically receive CLE credit without filling out an application. If your state requires CLE and your state does not offer CLE less capacity with Vermont or Pennsylvania, you may need to apply and officially move your state bar to receive CLE credit for attending the course. If you're solely attending this event to obtain CLE credit, please check to ensure that you'll be able to submit an individual attorney application with your state and that you understand the application process, requirements, and deadlines. If you're seeking CLE, please be sure to sign in and out with us today. After signing out, we'll check to ensure that you attended the full program. If you attend the entire event, you will receive a physical certificate of attendance after signing out. These certificates are used for verification of attendance, and you may need to submit one if you're applying to CLE in another jurisdiction. Upon receiving your certificate of attendance, you'll also receive the course evaluation. Please pull out the course evaluation and return it back to us before you leave. If you have any questions about CLE, please ask us at the sign in and sign out desk or just email us at cle at eli.org. We have a great event in store for you today. Please hold your questions until the end of the program, at which time we will bring around a microphone for you to use to ask your questions. I'm now going to introduce our wonderful moderator today, Victoria. Victoria joined the ELI as the 2022 through 2023 Public Interest Law Fellow in September of 2022. Her work includes assessing the feasibility of natural and nature based flood control measures in the Mississippi River Basin, analyzing tribal consultation requirements for local governments in California, educating state and federal judges on climate issues, and connecting attorneys across the nation with environmental pro bono opportunities. Before coming to ELI, Tori served as a law clerk with the California Department of Justice, Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, and Council on Environmental Quality. She holds a JD from Harvard Law School and a BA in Economics and Political Science with a minor in Environmental Science and Studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Tori, I will now hand this over to you. Thank you all so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is the sixth installation of our Community Lawyering for Environmental Justice series, which is hosted by ELI's Environmental Law Pro Bono Clearinghouse. The Clearinghouse accepts viable matters from communities and individuals who are seeking pro bono representation. Individuals or communities are typically referred by environmental law clinics, law clinics in general, nonprofits, and other attorneys. Once we have the matters, we post them on our website. The clearinghouse is open free of charge to both ELI members and non-members. We hope that you will join us in taking on this important and meaningful work. Um, community lawyering is often quite different from the usual work lawyers might do at a firm or a government agency. We want this series to be interactive and useful for attorneys and to take on community lawyering work. For example, we have a lot of questions about conflicts So one of our previous uh, series was about how to approach conflicts for a nonprofit, firm, or academic setting. Um, and we also have a variety of permitting matters in the clearinghouse. So today's series will feature um, 
will focus on permitting matters so that hopefully you can take one on after this. Uh, for today's event, I'm going to introduce each speaker and then they will have 10 minutes to present. I'll open it up to questions afterward. Uh, so let's get started with our wonderful panel. Um, speaking first will be Patrick DeArmey. Patrick is a staff attorney and joined the Chesapeake Legal Alliance in 2020. Patrick focuses on environmental enforcement and leads matters involving water quality, water resource protection, and water permitting. He represents clients in litigation and conducts pollution investigations and compliance suites through CLA's Environmental Action Center. As a CLA staff attorney, he brings experience with the Clean Water Act, administrative law, and environmental permitting to all of his enforcement works. Patrick's permitting work focuses on state and federal water pollution control permits, including individual and general stormwater permits, state non-title and tidal wetlands permits, and some local water permitting matters. All right, Patrick. All right. All right. Well, hi, hi everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to Eli for inviting me. Um, as Tori said, I'm Patrick DeArmey. I'm at Chesapeake Legal Alliance. Um, you know, we're a regional organization that's dedicated to providing free legal services to individuals community groups and our partner organizations to work to restore the health of the Chesapeake Bay watershed and protect the communities that live within it. Um, you know, we accomplish this mission um, through our, our six in-house attorneys as well as our law clerks, and we have our, our, our own pro bono network of vol pro bono volunteers, which consists of over 300 attorneys licensed throughout the um, watershed. You know, and before I get started, I just want to mention that, you know, all the work that I do and what I'm, what I'm going to discuss here today was developed by me and the whole team at CLA, and, and you know, it's really a team a team effort and I could not have done it without them. So um, for this, for my part of the presentation, I'm just going to run through some, uh, you know, best practices and tips for community lawyering. And, you know, my focus is specifically really on water permitting issues, um, you know, NIPDES permits, which are National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permits, you know, water pollution control permits on the individual and general side, as well as um, wetlands and waterways permitting. Um, and, you know, what I hope what I will be discussing today is going to really apply to, you know, all sorts of Pollution permitting, um, um, but the, you know, there's not really a set definition of, of you know what community lawyering is. Um, you know, in this presentation today, what I'm going to say is not really, you know, of course, not the end all, you know, be all on this topic, but hopefully it will, you know, get you all thinking and 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 generate some questions. So, you know, just generally, um, you know, our main goal when when we're representing clients at CLA is to sort of achieve. Well, we have sort of three main goals in terms of when we're representing clients in community matters, whether that's you know, individuals or, um, you know, groups. And essentially, the, you know, these are the, the sort of also pillars, considered pillars of environmental justice. And that would be, um, you know, access to information, access to participation in the in decision-making processes, and then access to justice. And I think between the three of us, we're all going to get into various details, of, you know, about these, uh, you know, these, these goals. Um, but just broadly, I um, mean, in the pollution permitting context, you know, access to information, you know, is essentially that, you know, people, people should have the right to access and, and access to the environmental information should should sort of be easy for people to get. Um, in the in the in the in the permitting context, this means you know where are the draft permits and the back sheets, you know, common response documents, any supporting documents related to the drafts that come out, you know, that the regulators have used, as well as you know information about where the pollution is going, where it's coming from, in terms of you know the existing um, community that's there and how the 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 new source or the renewed source of pollution is going to interplay with the, you know, the cumulative impacts of whatever the, you know, the surrounding community ecosystem is already dealing with. So that's, you know, that's access to information. And you'll see that these sort of ideas all flow from each other. And without one, you can't really have the other. And so, you know, access to participation and decision making is really about, you know, giving people the opportunity to be heard and involved in the environmental decision making process and in legislative processes as well. So this means that, you know, public notices need to be adequate um, and they need to reach the people that are going to be impacted by the pollution. You know, the public notices generally, in my opinion, should be sort of wide and across different media to reach the most people. You know, this means electronic, mail, you know, either direct outreach, you know, lots of regulators may not, um, you know, sort of meet this goal, but that it, it's sort of an ideal, um, you know, you want to be able to reach the most amount of people that are going to be impacted by a pollution permitting decision um, to be able to generate the most amount of comments and the most amount of involvement, you know, in the process, you know, and this and the decision makers can actually, you know, sort of benefit from this, 
from increasing and making sure that the um, public notice is robust because they can hear from the concerned groups that are actually going to be dealing with the pollution that's either a renewed source or a new source. And they also, you know, there are many individuals out there that are concerned about projects that have knowledge and expertise, and they can provide those in the form of public comments to, you know, the regulators, and that can help improve the process overall and, you know, and, and give essentially the, the regulators a very robust record to, to make their um, decision on. So that's sort of a, a brief summary of what we consider really access to participation in the decision making. And then, you know, the last one is access to justice, and that's you know, um, people need to have the right um, to either judicial judicial or some sort of administrative recourse, you know, when there is a permitting decision that either violates the law or is otherwise unreasonable, arbitrary, or, you know, lacks some substantial evidence to support the ultimate decision. Um, so I know that in many of the, you know, the DMV states here, um, you know, community groups or individuals won't have standing to challenge a case if they don't actually participate in the comment period. That's how a lot of um, statutes are written. And so if your client or a prospective client is concerned about something, you have to make sure, you know, it's a best practice to generally make sure that they are participating at least by submitting a comment either orally at a public hearing or a written public comment, because if not, the, you know, they might be essentially bounced from challenging the case before it even gets to that point. So that's just a very, um, important process to make sure people are involved because otherwise, you know, they might not be able to have that access to justice in terms of challenging a, a decision for, for whatever reason they may want to. So again, that's access to information, access to participation and access to justice. And you can see how they sort of all flow from each other. You know, if you don't have the right information about a, about a potential permitting case, then you can't adequately participate. And if you don't adequately participate, then you can't sort of, you know, use your rights to, you know, achieve justice in, in that case. So, you know, when we are either intaking cases or we're talking to prospective clients, you know, we always want to see, you know, where they're at in the case in terms of, you know, have they been involved in the public comment process? Has the public comment process even started yet? If it, if it has started, like, you know, did they submit comments? Is there an upcoming public hearing or a chance to, you know, submit comments? And, you know, what's the deadline, you know, and when is that information going to get in? So you have to sort of make sure all of these things, these boxes are checked. And then you can also... Um, you know, sort of advocate to the agencies to say, hey, look, you know, you're not going to get a, you're not going to get a lot of comments here, or you're not going to, you know, really have a robust record if you're not making sure that the people that are going to be impacted by this decision are adequately noticed. So, you know, if, if there's like, a, you know, like an internet desert or, you know, access to internet and people can't have it, you know, maybe, you know, most agencies probably and regulators won't do this, but you know, sometimes you might actually have to do direct mailings to people that are either downstream or adjacent to the site or, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, it's always good to, um, you know, sort of be in contact with the regulators that are making these decisions to try to see, okay, have, have they worked to try to engage the most amount of people that they can that are potentially going to be um, impacted by this? Um, you know, so, you know, we always advocate for you know, strict adherence to, you know, existing public notice procedures, as well as, you know, reading public notice um, statutes and regulations, like fairly broadly, so as to, like I said, encourage the most amount of people to be involved, and to submit their public comments, and to have the time to do it, you know, a, a big thing that we run into is they'll put out a public notice, and then 30, it's a 30 day comment period. Well, if you have the only way for you to get the information is to submit a Public Information Act request or a FOIA request, you know, those 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 requests often take more than 30 days to even get the files. And so we've had success in terms of reaching out to the people that are putting out the public notice in whatever regulatory agency saying, hey, can you make this this information available now? Because if you make us wait during for a public, I mean, for a, a public information act request or a FOIA request, we're not going to have the information to be able to review, to be able to un inform our comment writing and then give you the best comment that we can get. And, you know, oftentimes they, you know, the regulators can be receptive to that and they can make that, that information available. And, you know, in the last couple of years, a lot of the DMV states have done better at, um, you know, I mostly practice in Maryland, but states have done better at like making the information available, at least the draft permits and the draft fact sheets, you know, particularly for certain, you know, permitting decisions. So we always are trying to encourage the regulators to make all that information as readily available as possible. And then, you know, we can also take as attorneys, you know, the initiative to, if we're able to get the information, we give it to our clients and then they can disseminate it as well out to their membership groups or other, you know, other concerned entities. Um, you know, so that's broadly just those sort of three general principles about access. Um, 
you know, and I, I also have sort of a list here of and ideas about, you know, other general practices. Um, I mean, the first one I think that is really important is, you know, if someone comes to you as a prospective client or you've already, you know, engaged with them, you know, you really want to, um, you know, in the first couple of meetings, like listen to them and, and sort of understand what their concerns are, because you might see the permit and think that, you know, like what they're going to say in terms of what the problems are that they're dealing with or what the concern is or what the harms are, et cetera. But you really want to make sure that you, um, you know, are listening to what they're actually dealing with and then trying to tailor your representation and, and make clear, you know, sort of the expectations of what you can provide to them in terms of what they are dealing with. Because sometimes the harms that they're suffering aren't even, um, you know, necessarily related to the actual permitting decision. And so it can be tough in terms of setting expectations about, you know, what you're going to be able to provide, you know, with your legal assistance. So getting that understanding of what they're really dealing with upfront can be, um, you know, be very helpful. Okay, I only have a little bit of time left. So um, I'm going to just run through this, you know, the, so the general best practices, like I said, is listen is a very important one. In many of the DMV states, you can also do what they're called limited representation agreements. And, you know, the so specific states have different rules in the, either in the, in the ethics rules about what language has to be in a limited representation agreement. But I know in Maryland, like you can limit it to say, I will only represent you in helping you write this comment. But if you're going to challenge the permit, you know, we might have to come up with a new representation agreement or, or I might not be able to, to represent you. So that goes along with, you know, also setting clear expectations in terms of what you're able to um, provide to, you know, your clients. Um, so, you know, looking at whether or not you can do a limited representation agreement in certain situations is very important. Other things, and I would call these maybe um, like pitfalls you sort of you know, want to try to avoid. I've been in cases or in, in matters and advocacy projects where, you know, they're using group emails or they're using listservs or chains, and they, they can be really helpful for grassroots organizing. But if your client has, if you're representing a client and they are blasting out a whole bunch of stuff to, you know, email chains or listservs, you can get into a lot of trouble that way, especially if they are, you know, revealing confidential information that they maybe should not be to the to the general public. That these are people that are concerned with with the project, but they're not people that are actually within the attorney client relationship. And so you can void some of your privilege that way. So you really want to be careful. I mean, just generally, um, you know, everyone, if you're interested in doing this work, you should look up what's called slap suits, which is strategic lawsuits against public participation. Um, you know, that is when a potential defendant files uh, most usually frivolous lawsuit against you know your client. It's a lot of times it's defamation. Or something else like that, saying that you you said something in in the public comments or in the public that is defaming the defendant, and you really want to make sure that everything you know that there's sort of you're not you, you want to make sure that you avoid the possibility of someone filing a slap suit. You most of the times the slap suit are slap suits are not designed to be won by the defendant. They're just designed to drag down your client so that they can't put in the resources to submitting the comments that they're trying to make or to challenging the case or whatever. And then um, just two other really quick things is like. You know, you kind of want to decide with your clients, like whose voice do you want to use in the, in the advocacy? Is it best, is it coming from the lawyer is the best way to do it? Or is it best that it's coming from the actual groups themselves? Because some, you know, regulators or other, you know, other people in terms of doing organizing or whoever you're talking to, you know, sometimes the, the voice coming from your clients is better than, it, than having it come from the attorney. So you can sort of help write, but you want to make sure that, you know, you're not you know, going or sweeping over whatever your client wants to talk about. So it's important to, to see and decide like which, you know, whose voice do you want to talk about? And then just another sort of pretty specific thing is lots of States will allow you to extend the comment period. So you have to decide, like, do you want to extend the comment period or do you have your comments ready to go? Because sometimes if you extend the period, it can just extend the whole process out longer than you may want to. And if your comments are ready to go in the 30 days, then, you know, maybe you don't want to extend it. But maybe if it's a very robust record of stuff you have to review, you want to ask for that um, public comment period extension so that you have enough time to review all the information. And you can also pair that with you know, when you're trying to get the information from a FOIA request, okay, well, I got to wait for this 30 days. So can you extend the comment period until I get this information and then I can submit my comments. So that was a very quick, just sort of rundown of, you know, what I had here. So I'm going to kick it over to Morgan now. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll introduce Morgan quickly and then you can start your spiel. Morgan Johnson is the senior staff attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council and its Sustainable FERC project a coalition-based initiative that promotes the transition to a clean, low carbon and sustainable energy future. She represents the project and its staff advocacy work before FERC, DOE, federal courts, and other fora. 
Currently, her permitting work centers around federal authorizations for interstate nat natural gas pipelines, gas export authorizations, and infrastructure. Previously, Morgan was the staff attorney at Waterkeepers Chesapeake, an environmental NGO comprising, comprised of 17 waterkeeper programs in the Chesapeake and coastal bays of Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and DC. She earned her BA from Ohio State University and her JD in environmental law certificate from the University of New Mexico. All right, Morgan. All right, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I, you know, really, when thinking about what to talk about for community lawyering through the lens that I usually work in, could get into a lot of weeds <laughs> um, about federal gas permitting. There are a lot of environmental justice implications of the classes of projects that um, my permitting work touches on. So a lot of interstate natural gas pipelines that crisscross communities across the United States, uh, as well as uh, natural gas terminals, many of which uh, are sited in, in and around environmental justice communities and communities that are exposed to uh, many other industries as well. Um, but I thought that one of the most helpful things I could share just some, you know, practical um, tools and questions that um, you as a practitioner, you know, working on environmental justice issues, considering environmental justice issues in the permitting context might want to keep in your mind. So I brought five thoughts, lessons, ideas um, that I wanted to share. The first of which I think is relevant to, you know, my thoughts about being here today and talking about these issues first is who are you and who is your client, the community whose interests you're, you're considering. Um, first of all, NRDC is not an environmental justice organization. Um, our mission uh, obviously connects us to a lot of uh, communities, individuals and members who um, uh, are experiencing uh, environmental justice issues. Um, but, you know, it's important, like when engaging on those issues for myself, for example, to know that and know the history of um, the organization I work for. Uh, if I'm representing government, for example, if you're a practitioner representing government, or if you're uh, an industry or other lawyer, right, to have a knowledge about how, you know, me or the group that I've represented historically has interacted with environmental justice communities is extremely important. Um, and with that, right, um, as practitioners working on these issues, there's a lot of, um, you know, potential to slip in the mindset that, like, I'm an expert on a legal framework or, like, a policy framework and therefore I'm the expert on, you know, this issue, the set of issues, the legal matter, but it's extremely important um, to listen to, uh, prioritize and value um, and, um, you know, adequately um, uh, understand um, the expertise that's coming from the community uh, or, you know, set of interests you're advocating for. Um, I think, you know, some examples of this even demonstrate like legally that can be extremely relevant. Um, some of the most like famous federal environmental justice language um, from the courts that people cite to um, is that environmental justice is not merely a box to be checked. Um, like some of the principal issues and in, in that case, Friends of Buckingham really have to do with like agency dismissal of you know, community information, like direct from community information saying, hey, like, this is how our, our environmental justice community is scoped. We are an environmental justice community. And like the agencies at issues were utilizing environmental justice screen in a certain way that, you know, demonstrated um, that certain parts of the community were not indeed an environmental justice community. And the court actually looked at, well, there's credible information here from this community um, that demonstrates that they in fact are. So like that listening to community is absolutely important and could be really central to the cases that you're working on as well. Um, I guess the second big 
you know, thing of things to keep in mind is to really, really know your legal landscape um, in the federal permitting context and the federal um, context of environmental justice. I think a lot of people are sometimes surprised to learn that like there is not one, you know, overarching or like central environmental justice like statute. It's, you know, kind of a, a framework, like a patched framework of um, laws that you know lay out um, the federal government's responsibilities and its role when looking at environmental justice issues. And then also like the central statutes at play um, also you know, might have significant connections to environmental justice. So it's really important to know how that works. Um, most people know of the executive orders 12898 um, and the more recent uh, 14096. Um, uh, and also, you know, I think one of the most central ways that environmental justice issues play out in, for example, my day to day work um, on the environmental justice implications of gas projects is in the NEPA process where, um, you know, when agencies are looking at impacts of projects, um, you know, they're held to the arbitrary and capricious standard. Um, and have to look at the direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts of the projects that they're um, assessing and then approving. And so in that, you know, a significant part of that work is the environmental justice, looking at environmental justice impacts um, on, on communities. Um, and then lastly, you know, on that, um, the National, um, I'm sorry, the Natural Gas Act, um, has like in, in substantively how the agencies, you know, apply that law, whether it's DOE or FERC, um, in looking at factors that are within the public interest, explicitly environmental justice matters are a component of that. And so, you know, having a really strong understanding of like what applies, what doesn't, um, is obviously, you know, critically important when you're engaging. Um, and in thinking about applying that, the third you know, thing to keep in mind is to think broadly and creatively about the advocacy that you're doing. Um, I, as a practitioner, you know, really try to think of, especially at the like the record development stage, um, what are, you know, the full battery of things that are, are relevant to the project permit that we're looking at um, that an agency really might need to and absolutely should know um, that they might not. Um, given what, you know, is just in an application, for example. Um, and so thinking about like what studies should be there, what are other, um, you know, um, uh, institutional resources um, that exist, like what are some best practices I can raise in my comments as well, like really thinking broadly about, um, you know, what I could point an agency to and then later what I might want to point a court to is really important. And so I always encourage folks who are um, doing advocacy on permits to think of that as well. Um, and then also, you know, for folks who are working within the government or within these agencies, the thinking creatively um, in environmental justice context is also important when you're thinking about what are ways that we can improve um, our guidance, guidelines, like internal policy um, on environmental justice. Are there ways that we can, you know, sharpen um, our guidance that we have on um, how, like what applications themselves should include even? What are we going to look at? How are we going to get there um, is also really important. And, um, you know, even for industry um, to think creatively about like what mitigation is needed um, and what's, you know, what can we do um, to lessen the impact of infrastructure we are uh, proposing for that will impact environmental justice communities. Um, the fourth is just thinking about how uh, when you're, particularly when you're advocating uh, on behalf of an environmental justice community or folks with environmental justice impacts, really thinking critically about early intervention stage or like pre, um, uh, you know, before the agency is looking at the application and folks are engaging in the NEPA processes, 
really thinking about opportunities for engagement at that stage is important um, and advocating for a better process, as Pat said. Um, you know, I think there are definitely like other hats that you can wear other than just advocating before the agency. Um, and also, you know, by the time you're advocating uh, in the courts, right? Like there are earlier stage, um, uh, you know, policies that you can advocate for, um, advocating for better process, more resources for communities who are engaging in permitting processes. That's something that um, uh, we've asked for in the like FERC permitting um, context, for example, is actually providing you know, resources for communities to engage in these processes as well is critically important. Um, and then the fifth and, and final um, thought that I'll share is that outside of the actual um, permitting processes, there are a lot of, you know, potentials for new um, legal regimes and um, new ways of thinking about how we'll permit infrastructure in the future on the energy side. Um, there's a lot of thinking about like permitting transmission um, and ways to, you know, move and transport energy to meet increasing needs. And so there are a lot of really important conversations that are happening about how to do that in the most equitable way and how to, um, you know, build in um, considerations of environmental justice early on in the process and make sure um, that, you know, to the best of our ability, we're advocating um, and, and breaking old cycles of, um, you know, not uh, bringing environmental justice voices to the table while you're thinking about what those systems and structures will look like that will uh, permit these things. And so, you know, while we are at this place where we've got um, years of uh, study, thinking, um, precedent, uh, related to environmental justice as advocates um, thinking about how you can, you know, best um, advocate for environmental justice communities from the outset. Um, it's really important to when you're invited to lean in on those conversations about uh, how to affirmatively change and build those systems that um, folks lean in where they can. And so that's my thoughts. Thank you so much. Next, I'll introduce Jim Hecker. Jim is the Environmental Enforcement Project Director at Public Justice. After serving as a law clerk for two years with U.S. District Judge Prentice H. Marshall in Chicago, he joined Terrence and Sunderland, a Washington, D.C. public interest environmental law firm, as an attorney handling environmental citizen suits on behalf of national, national environmental groups, citizen groups, and other clients. In October 1990, Hecker left private practice after 11 years to join public justice to reestablish and lead public justice's environmental enforcement project. For more than three decades, Hecker has been fighting on behalf of local citizens, grassroots organizations, and national environmental organizations. While at public justice, Hecker has litigated more than 30 citizen suits in 14 states under federal environmental statutes regulating clean air, clean water, hazardous waste, and coal mining. Jim received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois and his JD from the University of Illinois College of Law. He earned distinctions as a member of the Order of the Voice and as editor of the Law Forum. During the law school, he interned with the Center for Law and Social Policy in Washington, D.C. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I'm very different than what these two people do. I, 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 they're doing great work, but it's very different than what I do. I follow a different model. I'm uh, basically what, a hired gun in a way. I bring citizen suits to enforce the law when the government fails to do so. A citizen suit is kind of a unique uh, species of the law. It's private enforcement of public law. You stand in the shoes of the government, you get public remedies, but the public remedies don't give any monetary benefits to my client. So I'm acting uh, when the government doesn't and trying to enforce the law. Um, it depends on three things to be effective. First, it requires the company to self-monitor its own violations and report them to the government and make that publicly accessible so, we can, so I can pick out who's the worst violator. Um, 
Second, it requires us, uh, well, it, 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 that's the first two, the, the self-monitoring and reporting to the government. The third is that if I win, I get my attorney's fees. So I have an incentive to bring those cases and I only get paid if I win. Um, so I've been doing that since 1984. And, you know, when you, when we, when I started in 1984, companies thought permits were a paper tiger. They thought they were just aspirational, something that, oh, you'd try to meet if you could, but you really didn't have to. And in the first cases we brought in New Jersey, we established that the permit is a legally binding document and you're going to get penalized if you violate it. And that's the way you get deterrence. I mean, the whole purpose of citizen suit penalties is to force uh, the company to comply and to make an example of them so other companies comply as well. Um, you know, the, the penalties have increased over the years. When I started uh, 40 years ago, um, you know, we, we were trying to get, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, uh, Exxon recently got a $14 million penalty. So these are big numbers. It's big litigation. How do you bring a case like this? Well, I have to research the databases. I find my own cases. I go into EPA's ECHO database. You know, when I started, <laughs> I would go up to EPA Region 2, plant my butt in a chair, pull out all the paper files and sit there for a week and write down on a, on a, on a notepad all the violations, go back, type up the notice letter myself and send it out. But now it's so much easier. EPA has an eco uh, uh, database. I can immediately download all of the violations in an entire state, put them in a spreadsheet and figure out who are the worst violators. It's amazing how much power you have. It's amazing, it's amazing how much power citizens have if they, if they realize that this information is publicly available and you can act on it. Now, how do I choose my clients? Um, they, they, Patrick talked about this. It is important when you're choosing a client. I'm very wary of choosing individual clients because especially if you've got multiple individual clients because they often have conflicts and they, or, or they'll be difficult to negotiate with. And I've had situations where we had a, 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 a very stubborn client who would refuse to accept our settlement and he had probably had to almost beg. And finally went to his wife and said, well, can you try to talk to your husband and try to get them to agree with us? And fortunately she did. And we were able to get, get uh, an agreement. So my, uh, the way I work is almost only representing organizations that I can trust and know that we have the same objectives and know that when I go to them with a settlement proposal, they'll have a rational response. Um, so it's, it's a, I think that that trust relationship between the attorney and the, the organization is critical um, because my, my entire fees are on the line, right? I don't get zip, you know, if they say, I, we don't like that proposal, you're going to trial. And I, say, and I say, well, I don't think we can do better than this at trial. Those are, those are really important dis, uh, discussions you have to have with your client and make sure that you're on the same page with them. Now, my cases cost money to, to litigate. I have to hire experts. I can spend anywhere from five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars. I don't. Our organization doesn't have that kind of money. So usually, what I have to do is convince a, a law firm with deep pockets to partner with me. Um, public justice has um, several thousand members. Has some of the richest public interest or uh, personal injury lawyers in the country who are special who specialize in trial litigation. So I can draw on their resources and their trial skills to help me bring these cases. Um, so that's, that's how I get started. That's how I start. And then the, the question is, how do you win a case? Of course, you have to pick a case that has a continuing set of violations that you have to, the best case is where there's a systematic failure in the treatment equipment so that you know that the violations are likely to continue for quite a while. And they have to put in um, a new piece of treatment equipment that's very expensive. And that shows they have a lot of economic benefit. And what drives penalties more than anything else in a Clean Water Act citizen suit is the economic benefit that they 
um, uh, gained by delaying compliance. That's, that's sort of the hard number that you can use to drive a penalty when you're in front of a judge. So the, the key, is, I mean, I've got a lot of experience and, and honed my judgment so I can pick out these cases. Um, but it, it, takes, it, it takes some expertise to figure out which ones are likely to, to be the most, the most profitable for me. Um, you know, it, it sounds kind of selfish when you say that's profitable, but the, the whole genius of citizen suits is that the public interest and the private interest sort of dovetail when you find one of these cases. I'll give you an example of the kind of cases I bring. So I've got, I had a case against a company in Pennsylvania. It was a poultry processor that um, uh, takes chicken parts and, and boils them down and um, uh, turns them into dog food, right? Uh, they were generating a huge amount of nutrient pollution that was polluting uh, the a tributary to the Susquehanna River and into the Chesapeake Bay, which causes fish kills. So standing is easy. You get somebody who uses the Chesapeake Bay for boating and doesn't like looking at um, uh, dead fish, right? And the, 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 um, the technology was they needed to put in additional treatments to remove those nutrients. And that was a fixed cost that they had delayed for 10 years. So those, and, and we ended up settling that case for a million dollars in, in settlement payments. And then we use that money not to go to penalties for the US Treasury, but when you settle, you can have, use it for environmental projects. So we asked the, the counties in the area near the plant where they needed money to restore streams that had eroded banks or sediment or other kinds of things that were in degrading water quality. So we, we took that money from that company's violations and plowed it back into the community to improve the watershed. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. And, um, how much time? I haven't been really over. You have a few more minutes. Two minutes. I wanted to just talk about some of the hot topics under citizen suits today. One is that what you, what you see is that when push comes to shove, um, companies uh, will, um, that can't meet their permits will ask states to enter into consent administrative order, orders to delay their compliance deadlines. and. The key here is that if it's a secret order, it has no preclusive effect on a citizen suit. The only way you can preclude a citizen suit is to have public participation in the administrative process and it has to go through a draft permit, it has to go through notice and comment. So in that Pennsylvania case I mentioned, because their administrative order that tried to extend their deadline was not publicly noticed, it had no preclusive effect, and we could get a penalty, even though the state had already previously penalized. Another issue is that unregulated pollutants. I've done a lot of work in West Virginia with coal mining for the last 25 years. And the two major pollutants from coal mines that are un were unregulated were selenium and conductivity. Conductivity is when you have dissolved solids in water, dissolved salts, uh, the conductivity increases. So uh, ocean water has conductivity of 60,000, what freshwater to 100. And what, we, what we've seen is that, you know, the, the states and EPA have been very reluctant to regulate uh, these pollutants because of the burden it puts on, on the coal industry. And the coal industry is in a very precarious state now in West Virginia and is in near bankruptcy. So we've had to have very creative strategies to go after these pollutants to try to force them to clean up streams because they, they polluted hundreds of miles of streams and prevented them from meeting water quality standards. I probably, I probably should stop there because I've exceeded my time, but um, uh, that gives you sort of a nutshell of, of uh, what I do with citizen suits. Great, thanks so much, Jim. Um, we're going to start some moderator-led questions now, but if anyone in the audience has any follow-up questions, please feel free to flag down Madison or Christine, and they'll bring you a microphone just so that we can hear it on the recording so people who are watching this later have an idea of what we're talking about when we answer it. All right. 
So to begin with, um, we've heard about how permitting processes raise broader environmental justice concerns, specifically about fair access to regulatory processes and opportunities for meaningful public participation. Uh, could any of our panelists please speak about how you advance those interests in your representation of communities and what you think regulators need to do to make sure that those needs are met? Yeah, well, I touched on that a little bit uh, in mind that, you know, one of the things that we've advocated around in some of the spaces where we advocate are for, you know, increased resources and opportunities for individuals to participate. Um, but, you know, some of the other ways that um, we've done that and, um, you know, or present potential opportunities for other folks to do that too, um, is to, yeah, really lean into the procedural justice stuff. Um, you know, one of the ways that um, uh, public feedback is received on some of these like gas projects is, um, you know, it, the opportunities for like in-person uh, opportunities to give uh, feedback in like a, a dictaphone was one of the ways that FERC was doing it. And in some of the like, you know, spaces uh, in the community where folks would go and like give feedback, they're like armed guards like present there, which I mean, this is, you know, important infrastructure, right? They're like, uh, you know, better, like potential safety issues, all of that. But when you're dealing with communities that have, um, you know, a really different lens and experience that some policymakers might have with, um, you know, law enforcement, right? There are important, like, little things about how folks are even able to have a sit at the table seat at the table that seems small but like for community members they're huge and that affects like how comfortable you know folks might feel engaging so I think looking for opportunities like that to to figure out like other better solutions um that are competent competent and um you know address like where the community come from is really important in terms of public engagement that's I think a pretty extreme example of that, a, a much less extreme example of that is like how much time communities member members have to engage in the process. Um, we just did a bunch of advocacy around a really short comment window for a pipeline project that, um, you know, it was like over a major holiday where most people would be out, right? And so we were able to go in and participate in the docket and make asks for increased time for the community and public to weigh in. And we got that time. So like, sometimes you need to know, like, what should I ask for and not be afraid to ask for that and think creatively as a lawyer, that's not just a direct aspect of challenging the project, but it's, you know, about getting more process uh, for folks to weigh in. Um, and so those are just, you know, a couple examples that we've seen. I can mean I can add a little. I mean, sometimes you literally, as the attorneys or or your your client groups, like you literally have to just do it yourselves in terms of like getting people engaged because the agency just won't do it. I mean, like Morgan said, we run into situations all the time where they put out an important public notice and it's right over a large holiday, and we tell them over and over again, you can't do this because you're it's you're not going to solicit the amount of feedback that you that should be solicited for this type of thing. So sometimes you just have to keep asking them and keep telling them like this is not appropriate for the situation. You can't put this comment period out over the holiday. And sometimes you just have to collect all the information yourselves and then disseminate it through your members, through your clients membership group that way and just ensure that they're that maybe they'll go out and knock on people's doors. Maybe they'll go and make sure that they immediately downstream neighbors or the fence line communities are aware of what's going on because you know lots of our clients are river keepers and so they have memberships all you know their members are all throughout their watersheds but it's not it's like I said at the beginning is you know sometimes people can't get on the internet or they don't know where to look for public notices so you sometimes you really just have to you know do like do it yourself and make sure that your client or you are actually putting out that information for people to see and then actually one other thing that's sort of related to this which I didn't mention in terms in terms of my list of sort of like best practices is in most cases if you're going to end up challenging a permitting decision you have to make sure that the record has what you in it what you want to challenge on because if the record doesn't include what you want to argue you can't use it it's sort of like in law school where you had like a closed universe exam where like you can only pull from whatever's in that closed universe that's how a lot of these 
permitting decisions are. They won't let you bring in sort of extra extra record evidence at the time it comes to, ch to challenge the permit. So you really want to make sure that all your comments and any anything that you could use in in a, in a legal challenge to the case is in your public comments so that that's available for you when you actually go to the challenge. And then just other things. I mean, in terms of environmental justice and climate change, I mean. We, you know, we recommend to our clients in almost all cases that there's at least some comment about the environmental justice or community impacts of the project. And there's some comment about how whatever decision they're making is either related to the climate adaptation or related to climate mitigation or both. And to make sure that those are in the in your public comments, because they, there might not be laws that are explicit about you know, climate change considerations and making sure the agency thinks about those or environmental justice consideration, making sure the agency thinks about those. But if you put it into your comment, it makes it into the record and then you can argue it in court. And it may not be an actual law about it, but you can potentially argue that it was arbitrary for them to ignore specific facts about climate change or to ignore specific facts about environmental justice impacts or that the record doesn't support the fact that there's not going to actually be any harm to these communities. So if you put that into the record, it can really help. And that can also help you push the law forward forward and get precedential decisions where the judge actually makes a decision on climate change or on environmental justice topics. And then you can use that as you continue to go forward a lot of what sort of Morgan was just talking about as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Patrick, you touched on this a little bit in your 10 minutes, but community groups often differ a lot from the clients that a pro bono attorney might typically represent, especially if you're used to uh, having very proactive corporate clients and you have to go out and get people riled up yourself. Um, do you have any other best practices for community lawyering, especially in permitting cases that you'd recommend to potential pro bono attorneys? Yeah, sure. I mean, one, I mean, again, I've said this over and over again, it's like making sure the agency is doing everything that they can to, to involve the most amount of people. And, you know, sometimes they'll want to schedule a comment period for like 10 o'clock in the morning and your client even though they're running a nonprofit or they're concerned, like they might have another day job and they can't participate. So, I mean, you really need to, you know, but sometimes that might be the best time. So you kind of want to know like from your, you know, your client group, what's the best time for them to be engaged. That also, that also goes into when you're actually going to be meeting with your clients, you know, maybe they do have day jobs and you have to set after hours or early morning or lunchtime meetings with them. So you might cut into your lunch that could be the only time that is going to be available for your client to meet. So, you know, it's just sort of making it easier. And like Jim was saying, like building up the trust with your client, especially if it's a sort of coalition of groups, trying to come to some sort of agreement beforehand about what the overall goals are before you end up writing the comments and before you end up going into litigation. You know, those things can be really helpful. It's just, you know, you really want to try to just try to make it easier for the, you know, the groups that you're representing, because a lot of the groups that we represent, at least, are very small organizations, and they don't have a ton of bandwidth. So the the, the easier you can make it for them, and the, the most amount of resources you can provide, you know, that can really, you know, push, get the ball rolling and, and get, you know, a good comment in and, and get you set up to if you actually want to litigate, you know, some sort of permit challenge. Great, thank you. Morgan, you mentioned you work with NRDC and a lot of your work intersects with environmental justice issues, but NRDC is not itself an environmental justice organization. Do you recommend any specific resources or principles for attorneys that are looking to become more oriented with environmental justice? Yes, there are a number and um, I'll just reveal like I was prepared for this question, so I wrote them all down. So I'm gonna run through the list a little bit. Um, uh, so yeah, EPA has a number of um, helpful like foundational resources on environmental justice and guidance. They have a number of resources on the website about Executive Order 12898 from 1994 and then 14096, which is relatively recent from 2023. Um, the NEJAC, which is um, also convened by EPA, has a number of really helpful resources. Um, and then the other EPA resource that I definitely want to raise in the NEPA context, I utilize this resource a lot, is promising practices for EJ methodologies in NEPA reviews. Um, and, you know, a really helpful resource um, when you're looking at EJ issues. Um, and then some of the other federal resources, there's the WEJAC, which is the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, um, they have a number of really helpful recommendations and resources that they've put out, including on 
um, like best practices for holding public meetings and like public forums um, for soliciting community impacts related to environmental justice that have a lot about like Pat was talking about, you know, the times that meetings are held or like best practices when you're engaging with like tribes and indigenous communities as well. Um, so that's a great resource. Um, the CEQ and uh, Office of Science Technology Policy of the White House also put out guidance on federal agencies on indigenous knowledge, which is extremely um, important too, um, with the way that, you know, there's the government to government relationship that the federal agencies, um, uh, you know, have to maintain and best practices and that, but also I think for, you know, organizations and individuals, there's some helpful best practices there. Um, and on permitting policy and impacts and, um, you know, just some aspects of like the, some of the more like global aspects, uh, we act for environmental justice is a really excellent organization that, um, has a lot of policy papers, resources on environmental, uh, like emerging, uh, permitting issues. Um, in the environmental justice context, also the Bullard Center on Environmental Justice. Uh, Texas Southern University has some really helpful resources on um, the health impacts of uh, projects and, um, you know, the way that agencies have uh, engaged before. And then the last thing I have is one book, uh, Environmental Justice Law Policy and Regulation uh, by Via et al. Um, I think it's a really great, like, relative to, like, other case books that, you know, we've all had or, like, desk books. Um, helpful resource that kind of gives both the history and then like, you know, working history of uh, environmental justice and environmental law um, and, you know, relatively current trends. Um, so those are just a few of the resources that I use. Can I make a comment on environmental justice? I mean, my, the difficulty I've had in litigating that issue is that no statute gives you a right of action to enforce environmental justice. The closest that you get is Title VI, and that just allows you to file a petition with EPA and hope that EPA will rule in your favor, but you don't even have a right to appeal it. It's just sort of a, a request. So I'm, I'm wondering what your current view is on the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of Title VI and whether you recommend that people try to use that anymore. Yeah, so I don't do Title VI litigation. Um, mm -hmm. I know that there um, is a lot of like thought right now um, in like broader environmental justice um, legal spaces about the efficacy of Title VI and um, in terms of the way that like, um, you know, at the agency level, like the long log of um, Title VI cases that, EPA has um, and uh, like complaints that folks have raised. And so there's only um, been about one or two that I've ever been successful, right? Yeah. It's well, just a handful. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's consistent with my knowledge. And again, I will say I, I don't work on this area set, so yeah. I'm not the expert there. Um, but I think that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conversations happening about that for practitioners who do focus on it. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's a hot topic, one, one worth exploring. Um, yeah. To briefly interrupt, for anyone who's unfamiliar with Title VI, it is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin by any entity that receives federal funds. So this includes like state permitting authorities that get funding from EPA. Um, and the Supreme Court has interpreted Title VI to uh, allow for disparate impact claims uh, when the law refers to the consequences of the actions rather than just the mindset of the actor. So you can get unintentional discrimination as well as intentional discrimination uh, claims with Title VI. Yeah, actually on the, on the Title VI thing, um, there is a, I guess you could consider it a success. Um, I, I think it was the Patuxent Riverkeeper filed a Title VI complaint against various agencies in Maryland um, during their certification of public notice and convenience process for permitting power plants. And that went through years of settlement and eventually they did win a settlement and 
part of the settlement, both um, Maryland DNR and Maryland MDE and the Maryland Public Service Commission changed their regulations to basically um, do what we've been talking about, which is try to engage the community more and try to get better involvement from the actual impact of communities that, um, you know, for where they're going to be citing power plants and citing in all sorts of power infrastructure. So, you know, part of that resolution, I think there was a, it was a fairly modest penalty from the, um, that, you know, they seek the penalty from an actual uh, power plant that was see, being cited. And some of that money actually went to the Riverkeeper and the Riverkeeper then used that for educational programming. But one of the main, I think, probably beneficial results is that they did actually, through rulemaking, change all of the regulations for that specific type of power plant citing to, to basically make it a more robust and sort of try to address some of the environmental justice concerns about lack of access to the information and lack of access to be able to participate in, in the process. So there have been some success, but I, I don't practice in that area either, so I can't really speak on it much more than that. Great. Um, Patrick, would you like to speak about any common pitfalls you've come across in your community-based permitting work, including like the time it takes to, to take on these claims, and, um, Clearly establishing what assistance you can and cannot provide to communities. Yeah, I mean, um, like I mentioned before, I mean, one one thing you just you want to sort of caution your clients on is, you know, the the group emails and the group chains and the group listservs, just because you know people don't necessarily know what's confidential. If that you, you might have explained it to them, but they don't necessarily understand like what needs to be held in confidence within your attorney client relationship and what is public and available to go out, you know, on these group chains and sort of trying to generate other interests. So, you know, I have run into issues where, you know, certain things are disclosed maybe before they should have been, or, you know, they, they were going to be potential arguments that were going to come out when, you know, a filing was made. So they became public eventually, but, you know, they were you know, sort of gone out to people beforehand. So that's something you sort of just want to be very careful with. Um, like I said, again, it's like the slap suits, you know, you want to, um, I encourage everyone to sort of just look up what those are. You, we could spend a whole hour just discussing those. Um, you want to just make sure you, you, that your clients are going to try to avoid those, um, you know, avoid even the, 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 the prospect of them. Um, yeah, one thing is not including something in your public comment that you might want to use later, because like I said, then you can't use it if you're actually going to end up litigating the case. Um, also, you know, we commonly run into the case where, you know, a group or an individual or who, whoever you may be representing, like they want something to be shut down, they want it to be halted, no matter what, they want it to be stopped. And that's just whether it's a renewal of a permit or something that you just know that you like, I just know from my, you know, practice and experience, like, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to get like something to just completely stop, especially if you're just challenging the renewal of a permit or something of that nature. Um, you, you just have to be really clear about what your expectations can be. And if they come to you and say, we want to hire you or to represent us to shut this thing down, um, you just, you have to be very honest with them about whether or not that's actually possible. And you have to really explain, you know, what are some of the other, you know, what, what, what are the, maybe like, you know, what are the interests that they have about why they want to shut this down? And maybe you can address those interests and concerns through another way that, that doesn't actually result in shutting down or stopping or halting whatever the process is. I know that it, in, in my case of about, you know, dealing with what I mostly deal with, which is water pollution permitting, a lot of it is just renewals and a lot of it is, you know, wetlands permits for development projects that are already baked in through the through the through the county zoning decisions and so it's a, it's very hard to stop a lot of the projects that i end up getting retained on and so it's more about like you know what are the interests that you actually have and how can you reduce the harm how can you make sure that the process is done well enough so that people are involved and if necessary you know build up your record in your case to be able to be able to challenge it great thank you and jim you mentioned um getting a penalty to fund the cleanup of the dog food processing plant that polluted the Susquehanna. Do you have any other examples of creative remedies that you've seen applied in permitting citizen suits? Um, and maybe any advice on how to get this implemented? Yeah, I, I wanna follow up a little bit first about what oh. Patrick said, because one of the things that I try to do is force companies to internalize the costs of pollution treatment that they've avoided. And that can make the the company uneconomic and shut it down. And that's what we were trying to do with the coal industry in West Virginia because they were violating their permits left and right. 
and not investing in the treatment equipment that they would have required. And so for selenium, for example, we forced one company to spend $40 million to build a, a selenium treatment plant using reverse osmosis. Um, uh, unfortunately, we learned that after the consent decree <laughs> expired, uh, they sold it for scrap shut it down and sold it for scrap and injected the water into underground formations uh, in lieu of treatment. So, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult. Um, but going back to your other question, yeah, we, when, when you do have the leverage of getting summary judgment on liability and a company facing millions of dollars in penalties, then you can go and ask them to settle and make payments uh, in lieu of penalties. Um, to third parties. You can't get it for the plaintiff because that would be a conflict of interest and the Department of Justice would object. But if it's an uh, objective third party that's like a county or a city that has a project um, that, that's in the same watershed, you can get things like a, a watershed restoration plan. Um, you can uh, do specific restoration projects. Um, you can do what in West Virginia, we got $30 million to restore watersheds that have been damaged by coal mining, hired our own experts to come in and plant trees and um, uh, restore the watershed. So there, there's potentially huge benefit from these citizen suits um, if you can um, channel the money into these productive settlements and the EPA policy uh, allows those things. In fact, they're now encouraging them more than ever uh, in line with their in environmental justice policies. And they want to know about uh, what they, they're particularly interested in projects that benefit the community right next to where the plant is that you're suing. So, so it, it sort of dove, dovetails you know, with my, my remedies and environmental justice remedies can in some ways connect that way. Great, thank you so much. Let's see, end of our moderator led questions. So if you have more questions you'd like to ask our panelists, you can ask them in our happy hour after this, which I'm sure everyone is looking forward to. Um, we will need to move all of these tables and chairs out of the way so that you all can mingle in a space that's not in the tiny little area over there. So we might ask you, or we will ask you to stand in our lobby for a little bit while we do that. But in the meantime, um, if you are applying for CLE, please make sure that you sign out on the sign out sheet so you get your CLE credit. Um, and if you are interested in taking on a permitting matter in the clearinghouse, we are like 15, and I am so happy to talk to you about any of them, as is anyone else who is in the line. So please just find me and ask about our permitting matters and how to sign up for the clearinghouse. Thank you so much for coming out today. It's great to have you all here, and I'll see you in the hours.